Hello, Democrats. Are you ready to elect Kamala Harris, the first pres president of the United States? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Friends, like so many of us, my grandparents came from Ireland as teenagers with nothing but hope in their hearts and fire in their bellies. They built their lives in the promised land of Buffalo, New York. A union card meant good work at the steel plant, the steel plant that lifted my parents from living in a trailer to the middle class. Like other families in my blue-collar community, they believed that with hard work, they could build a better future, not just for themselves, but for those with less hope and less opportunity. I'm proud of my roots and the values I learned. Grit, determination, compassion. Kamala Harris and Tim Walls grew up with those same values. And those values have always defined the people of my state. Well, most of us anyway. Donald Trump was born a New Yorker, but ended up a fraud, a philanderer, and a felon. He wasn't raised with the New York values that I know. He never had to worry about childcare costs or groceries or rent. He never had to worry about anything or anyone but himself. Trust me, America, if you think you're tired of Donald Trump, talk to a New Yorker. We've had to deal with him for 78 long years. The fraud, the tax dodging, the sham university, the shady charities. We've seen him stiff contractors, rip off workers. He abuses women, brags about it, and then takes away their rights. And New Yorkers are sick of it. It's no wonder he had a fleet of Mar-a-Lago. Sorry about that, Florida. Sorry about that. Trump hasn't spent much time in New York lately, except that is to get convicted of 34 felonies. And that's just fine with us, because New York's motto is Excelsior, ever upward. And Trump takes us ever downward. Because here's what Trump never understood. America isn't a luxury good to be bought and sold by the privileged and powerful few. America, we just can't afford another four years of that. We have kids to feed, roads to build, jobs to create, real problems to solve. And we need leaders who can get it done. Trump talked big about bringing back manufacturing jobs. But you know who actually did it? President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Kamala. And look no further than the city of Syracuse, where a company called Micron is building a $100 billion microchip factory with union labor. It's, it's the largest private investment in American history, and it's going to create 50,000 good-paying jobs. The Biden-Harris administration has made the most significant 
investments in our economy in generations. And as President, Kamala Harris will continue to build an opportunity economy for all. My friends, history is watching us. Together, we must protect abortion rights. Together, we must protect the middle class. Together, we must protect the American dream. And together, we must elect Kamala Harris President of the United States. Thank you. to be with everyone this evening in this hall and everyone at home. This is going to be a great week. And I want to kick us off by celebrating our incredible President Joe Biden, who will be speaking later tonight Joe, thank you for your historic leadership, for your lifetime of service to our nation, and for all you will continue to do. We are forever grateful to you. Thank you, Joe. And looking out, looking out at everyone tonight, I see the beauty of our great nation, people from every corner of our country and every walk of life are here, united by our shared vision for the future of our country. And this November, we will come together and declare with one voice, as one people, we are moving forward. With optimism, hope, and faith, so guided by our love of country, knowing we all have so much more in common than what separates us, let us fight for the ideals we hold dear, and let us always remember, when we fight, we win. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. Good night, everyone. so much. Thank you. It is so fun to be back here in the United Center. And as you guys know, a lot of good stuff has happened in this building, especially in the 90s. You young people, Google Michael Jordan, and you can read all about it, okay? So there was an amazing vibe in this building back in those days, and I feel that same winning spirit here tonight. So the last time I was in a packed basketball arena was in Paris, France. Nine days ago, some of the best players on earth 12 incredible American men came together to win Olympic gold. And the next night, I was back in that same building watching 12 more of the best players on earth. Our incredible American women do the same thing. And I cannot think of a better metaphor for what this country is all about than the way Team USA came together at the Olympics. We had players from across our wonderful country, players who have trained and fought relentlessly, shed tears trying to beat one another throughout their careers, joining forces to wear the red, white, and blue. And when we won, the American flag raised to the rafters, the national anthem playing, gold medals draped around the necks of our players whose hands were held over their hearts, it was the proudest moment of my life. Thank you.
Thank you. Now, I, I could never have imagined that a few days later I would receive an invitation to step into a different kind of arena. And so here I am. I know, I know very well that speaking out about politics these days comes with risks. I can see the shut up and whistle tweets being fired off as we speak. But I also knew as soon as I was asked that it was too important as an American citizen not to speak up in an election of this magnitude. The reason I said yes to speaking here tonight is that as a coach and former player, as a husband, a son, a father, even a grandfather, and as an American, I believe in a certain kind of leadership. I believe that leaders must display dignity. I believe that leaders must tell the truth. I believe that leaders should be able to laugh at themselves. I believe leaders must care for and love the people they are leading. I believe leaders must possess knowledge and expertise, but with the full awareness that none of us has all the answers. And in fact, some of the best answers often come from members of the team. And if you look for those qualities in your friends or your boss or an employee or your child's teacher or your mayor, then shouldn't you want those same qualities in your president? And when you think about it that way, this is no contest. With Kamala Harris and Tim Walls, I see all those qualities. They have devoted their lives to serving other people. Whether Vice President Harris was defending her community in the courtroom, or Governor Walls was inspiring the next generation in the classroom, or on the field, for that matter. By the way, coach to coach, that guy's awesome. Although, I have to say, Coach Walls, way too much reliance on the Blitz in 99 against Mankato East. You had a strong defensive line. I would have played more press coverage with your corners and then dropped the safeties into a Tampa 2. That's just me. Sorry. I wanted you to know how I feel every day of the NBA season. All right. But listen, the joy, the compassion, the commitment to our country that we saw at the Olympics, that is what Kamala Harris and Tim Walls have. And it is what our country needs. Leadership, real leadership. Not the kind that seeks to divide us, but the kind that recognizes and celebrates our common purpose. Think about what our team achieved with 12 Americans in Paris, putting aside rivalries to represent our country. Now imagine what we could do with all 330 million of us playing on the same team. Not as, not as Democrats, not as Republicans, not as Libertarians, but as Americans who know the greatness of this nation doesn't come from any one of us, but from each of us doing our part to build a more perfect union. That vision is what this campaign is all about. It's why I'm here tonight, and it's why I'll be getting out every day to help people get out and vote on November 5th and elect Kamala Harris and Tim Walls as the next President and Vice President of the United States. And, and after the results are tallied that night, we can, in the words of the great Steph Curry, we can tell Donald Trump, night, night. Thank you. Please welcome New York Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez.
for your vision. Chicago for your energy. Thank you, Kamala Harris and Tim Walls for your vision. And thank you, Joe Biden, for your leadership. You know, six years ago, I was taking omelet orders as a waitress in New York City. I didn't have health insurance. My family was fighting off foreclosure, and we were struggling with bills after my dad passed away unexpectedly from cancer. Like millions of Americans, we were just looking for an honest shake. And we were tired of a cynical politics that seemed blind to the realities of working people. It was then only through the miracles of democracy and community that the good people of the Bronx and Queens chose someone like me to elect them in Congress. And America, in my heart, I know from that same cloth of hope and aspiration, we will also elect Kamala Harris and Tim Walls as President and Vice President of the United States of America. I am here tonight because America has before us a rare and precious opportunity. In Kamala Harris, we have a chance to elect a president who is for the middle class because she is from the middle class. She understands the urgency of rent checks and groceries and prescriptions. She is as committed to our reproductive and civil rights as she is to taking on corporate greed. And she is working tirelessly to secure a ceasefire in Gaza and bringing hostages home. In Kamala Harris, I see a leader who understands. I see a leader with a real commitment to a better future for working families. And Chicago, we have to help her win. Because we know that Donald Trump would sell this country for a dollar if it meant lining his own pockets and greasing the palms of his Wall Street friends. And I, for one, am tired about, of hearing about how a two-bit union buster thinks of himself as more of a patriot than the woman who fights every single day to lift working people out from under the boots of greed, trampling on our way of life. The truth is, Don, you cannot love this country if you only fight for the wealthy and big business. To love this country is to fight for its people, all people, working people, everyday Americans like bartenders and factory workers and fast food cashiers who punch a clock and are on their feet all day in some of the toughest jobs out there. You know, ever since I got elected, Republicans have attacked me by saying that I should go back to bartending. But let me tell you, I'm happy to any day of the week because there is nothing wrong with working for a living. Imagine, imagine having leaders in the White House who understand that, 
leaders like Kamala and Tim. But Chicago, just because the choice is clear to us does not mean that the path will be easy. Over the next 78 days, we will have to pour every ounce, every minute, every moment into making history on November 5th. But we cannot send Kamala and Tim to the White House alone. Together, we must also elect strong Democratic majorities in the House and in the Senate so that we can deliver on an ambitious agenda for the people. Because if you are a working parent trying to afford rent and childcare, Kamala is for you. If you are a senior who had to go back to work because your retirement didn't stretch far enough, Kamala is for you. If you're an immigrant family just starting your American story, Kamala is for you. America, when we knock on our neighbor's door, organize our communities, and elect Kamala Harris to the presidency on November 5th, we will send a loud message that the people of this nation will not go back. We choose a new path and open the door to a new day, one that is for the people and by the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. God bless. God bless you all. in this room, just like there is across the country. Something, something is happening in America. You can feel it. Something we've worked for and dreamed of for a long time. First, though, let's salute President Biden. He, he has been democracy's champion at home and abroad. He brought dignity, decency, and confidence back to the White House. And he showed what it means to be a true patriot. Thank you, Joe Biden, for your lifetime of service and leadership. And 
And now we are writing a new chapter in America's story. You know, my mother Dorothy was born right here in Chicago before women had the right to vote. That changed 104 years ago yesterday. Think about it. Tennessee became the final state. to ratify the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. The state legislature was deadlocked until one lawmaker's mother, a widow who read three newspapers a day, sent a letter, a letter to her son. No more delays, she wrote. Give us the vote. And since that day, every generation has carried the torch forward. In 1972, a fearless black congresswoman named Shirley Chisholm she ran for president. And her determination let me and millions of others dream bigger, not just because of who she was, but because of who she fought for. Working parents, poor children, the last, the least, and the lost. In 1984, I brought my daughter to see Geraldine Ferraro, the first woman nominated for vice president. If we can do this, Jerry said, we can do anything. And then there was 2016, when it was the honor of my life to accept our party's nomination for president. Nearly 66 million Americans voted for a future where there are no ceilings on our dreams. And afterwards, we refused to give up on America. Millions marched, many ran for office. We kept our eyes on the future. Well, my friends, the future is here. my mother and Kamala's mother could see us, they would say, keep going. Shirley and Jerry would say, keep going. Women, women fighting for reproductive health care are saying, keep going. building better lives, parents stretching to afford childcare, young people struggling to pay the rent. They're all asking us to keep going. So, with faith in each other and joy in our hearts, let's send Kamala Harris and Tim Walls to the White House. You know, the story of my life and the history of our country is that progress is possible but not guaranteed. We have to fight for it and never, ever give up. There is always a choice. Do we push forward or pull back? Come together as we the people or split into us versus them? That's the choice we face in this election. Kamala has the character, experience, and vision to lead us forward. I 
know her heart and her integrity. We both got our start as young lawyers, helping children who were abused and neglected. That kind of work changes a person. Those kids stay with you. Kamala carries with her the hopes of every child she protected, every family she helped, every community she served. So as president, she will always have our backs, and she will be a fighter for us. She will fight to lower costs for hardworking families, open the doors wide for good-paying jobs, and yes, she will restore abortion rights nationwide. As a prosecutor, Kamala locked up murderers and drug traffickers. She will never rest in defense of our freedom and safety. Donald Trump fell asleep at his own trial. And when he woke up, he made his own kind of history, the first person to run for president with 34 felony convictions. As Vice President, as Vice President, Kamala sat in the Situation Room. As Vice President, Kamala sat in the Situation Room and stood for America's values. I know what it takes, and I can tell you, as Commander-in-Chief, Kamala won't disrespect our military and our veterans. She, she reveres our Medal of Honor recipients. She won't be sending love letters to dictators. She will defend democracy and our Constitution and will protect America from enemies, foreign and domestic. Think about it. The Constitution says the President's job is to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Those are the words of our founders. Take care. Just look at the candidates. Kamala cares, cares about kids and families, cares about America. Donald only cares about himself. On her first day in court, Kamala said five words that still guide her. Kamala Harris, for the people. That is something that Donald Trump will never understand. So it is no surprise, is it, that he is lying about Kamala's record? He's mocking her name and her laugh. Sounds familiar. <laughs> but we have him on the run now. So, so, no matter what the polls say, we can't let up. We can't get driven down crazy conspiracy rabbit holes. We have to fight for the truth. We have to fight for Kamala as she will fight for us. Because you know what? 
It still takes a village to raise a family, heal a country, and win a campaign. And America needs every one of us, our energy, our talents, our dreams. We're not just electing a president, we're uplifting our nation. We're opening the promise of America wide enough for everyone. Together, we put a lot of cracks in the highest, hardest glass ceiling. And tonight, tonight, so close to breaking through once and for all, I want to tell you what I see through all those cracks and why it matters for each and every one of us. What do I see? I see freedom. I see the freedom to make our own decisions about our health, our lives, our loves, our families. The freedom to work with dignity and prosper to worship as we choose or not, to speak our minds freely and honestly. I see freedom from fear and intimidation, from violence and injustice, from chaos and corruption. I see the freedom to look our children in the eye and say, in America, you can go as far as your hard work and talent will take you and mean it. And you know what? On the other side of that glass ceiling is Kamala Harris raising her hand and taking the oath of office as our 47th President of the United States. Because, my friends, when a barrier falls for one of us, it falls. It falls and clears the way for all of us. So for the next 78 days, we need to work harder than we ever have. We need to beat back the dangers that Trump and his allies pose to the rule of law and our way of life. Don't get distracted or complacent. Talk to your friends and neighbors. Volunteer. Be proud champions for the truth and for the country that we all love. I want, I want my grandchildren and their grandchildren to know I was here at this moment, that we were here and that we we're with Kamala Harris every step of the way. This is our time, America. This is when we stand up. This is when we break through. The future is here. It's in our grasp. Let's go win it. Please welcome Texas Representative Jasmine Crockett. at an HBCU. HU. 
The other was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and helped his daddy in the family business. Housing discrimination, that is. She became a career prosecutor while he became a career criminal. With 34 felonies, two impeachments, and one porn star to prove it. <laughs> Her entire career as an elected district attorney, attorney general, and senator, she's always worked for one client, the people. Meanwhile, he's a 78-year-old, lifelong predator, fraudster, and cheat known for inciting violent mobs. Listen, y'all, he's only looked out for one person, himself. As women are dying, he is bragging about overturning Roe. And y'all know I come from Texas. And right now in Texas, come on, Texas. But right now in Texas, they want to institute the death penalty. That is a problem. While Kamala Harris is fighting for our reproductive rights to be restored. She is also the leader we need on the global stage. She helped secure the release of Americans wrongfully detained in Russia. At the same time, he cozies up to his role model, Vladimir Putin, and MAGA holds legislation hostage here at home, critical resources to secure the border, military aid to Ukraine, and even the Farm Bill. She's lived the American dream while he's been America's nightmare. America, looking at the two choices before you, who would you hire? Donald Trump? No. Or Kamala Harris? Yes. Kamala Harris has a resume. Donald Trump has a rap sheet. <laughs> she presides over the Senate while he keeps our national secrets next to his thinking chair. Y'all know what I said that other time. In real Lago. <laughs> While Donald Trump wants to put our 1787 Constitution through his Project 2025 paper shredder and make every day January 6th, Kamala Harris is fighting to fulfill the promise of America. In the real world, this wouldn't even be close. But this election is. Don't make a mistake. We are the underdogs in this fight. Even though there is only one person qualified, only one person who's done the work and who has delivered the results. And she needs you. She needs your one vote this November. Can we count on you? you know a little bit of my history, some of you don't, so let me tell you. I was a public defender. I did criminal defense as well as practice civil rights law for almost two decades. I know a good prosecutor when I see one. Kamala Harris is the kind of prosecutor we long for in the cases like those of Breonna Taylor. Yeah. She was the first attorney general in the nation to order that her officers wear body cams, and she started the Back on Track program to reduce recidivism. Listen, y'all, she did all these things because she genuinely cares about people. She sees each person as just that, a person, not a statistic. 
She's proven that since the first day she stepped into a courtroom and said what y'all already heard Hillary say, I did not copy out for her speech. I just want y'all to know. <laughs> she walked into that courtroom and said, Kamala Harris for the people. And she meant that. Many of you know her credentials. But what I love about Kamala Harris goes beyond her resume is that she sees the humanity in everyone. She's the only candidate in this race who is capable of empathy. When I first got to Congress, I wasn't sure I made the right decision. The Chaos Caucus couldn't elect a speaker, and the Oversight Committee was unhinged. I was going through all of this when I visited the Vice President's residence for the first time. As I approached Vice President Harris for our official photo, she turned to me and asked, what's wrong? Mind you, we'd never met, but she saw right through me. She saw the distress. I immediately began crying. And the most powerful woman in the world wiped my tears and listened. It's so hard for me to tell this story. She then said, among other things, you are exactly where God wants you. Your district chose you because they believe in you, and so do I. The next month, I went viral for the first of many times to come <laughs> for hitting Republicans with a dose of their own medicine. That brief but impactful interaction gave me my legislative legs, and I've been running ever since. The question before us is, will a vindictive, vile villain violate voters' vision are back in style. <laughs> we deserve better. We deserve a president who can be a bright light in a sea of darkness. One who will put us, who will pull us forward because we won't go back. <laughs> Amanda Gorman said it best. There's always light if only we are brave enough to see it. If only we are brave enough to be it. Kamala Harris showed me that light. And America, when she is our president, together we will shine as that beacon of hope and freedom around the world once more. God bless y'all. Hadley Duvall is one of the bravest people I've ever met. I'm amazed at the courage it takes to share her pain, to share her truth. Yet Donald Trump brags about tearing a constitutional right away from Hadley and every other woman and girl in our country. That's why we must tear away any chance he can ever be president ever again. In 21 states, 
Trump's actions have resulted in extreme bans on abortion in my state, even in cases of rape, incest, and non-viable pregnancies. That leaves 12-year-old girls like Hadley with no options. That fails any test of humanity, any test of basic decency, any test of whether you have any underlying empathy. Thankfully, this extremism is being soundly rejected all over our country. In Kentucky, we put reproductive freedom on the ballot last November, and I beat Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell's hand-picked candidate by more than five percentage points. This November, we're going to beat them again. Elect Kamala Harris and Tim Walz and protect reproductive freedom. Folks, Donald Trump appointed the Supreme Court justices who got us into this mess. His Project 2025 goes even further. Here's the thing. Trump and Vance simply don't believe in your freedom. Trump says people are absolutely thrilled that women have their basic rights eliminated. J.D. Vance says women should stay in violent marriages and that pregnancies resulting from rape are simply inconvenient. Their policies give rapists more rights than their victims. That's not inconvenient, it's just plain wrong. And a woman grieving a non-viable pregnancy shouldn't be required to carry it to term just to listen to her child die or to hear no sound at all. All women should have the freedom to make their own decisions. Freedom over their own bodies. Freedom about whether to pursue IVF. Freedom about whether to have children at all. How we treat people transcends party lines. It goes right to the heart of who we are. My faith teaches me the golden rule that I am to love my neighbor as myself. In the parable of the Good Samaritan says we are all each other's neighbors. So I want anyone watching tonight, Republican, Independent, Democrat, to know that you are welcome here. We believe in an America where we live out our values, end anger politics once and for all, and move beyond this us versus them by remembering we are all Americans. That's how Joe Biden and Kamala Harris lead. They both called to ask how they could help Kentucky in recovering from natural disasters. They helped us improve our roads, our bridges, and invested in our people. They didn't ask me who Kentuckians voted for. They asked me what Kentuckians needed, and folks, they delivered. <laughs> Kamala Harris gets it. She knows we must move beyond anger, extremism, and division, that everyone has dignity and deserves respect. America, we're going to win. And we're going to win by staying true to our values of compassion, empathy, and doing right by our neighbors. I'm so proud to be all in for the next President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Thank you.
Thank you so very much. On January 5th, 2021, the people of Georgia did an amazing thing. They sent a black kid who grew up in public housing and the Jewish son of an immigrant to the United States Senate in one fell swoop. And among those Georgians was my then 82-year-old mother. She grew up in Waycross, Georgia. Do you know where that is? It's way across Georgia. She grew up in Waycross, Georgia, where she picked other people's cotton and other people's tobacco. But because this is America, the 82-year-old hands that used to pick somebody else's cotton and somebody else's tobacco picked her youngest son to be a United States Senator. This is my America. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, America, for raising your voice and using your vote. A vote is a kind of prayer for the world we desire for ourselves and for our children, and our prayers are stronger when we pray together. And so together, together we flipped the Senate, held the House, and we sent Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to the White House. Together, together we vaccinated our citizens, we fortified our cities and our towns, and we stood by our small businesses Together, we set out to heal the land. A nation besieged by a deadly pandemic and beset by the awful and divisive rhetoric of a man too small for the office entrusted him or the task set before him. The day after my January 5th election, he instigated an insurrection, a violent assault on our nation's capital and the peaceful transfer of power, all driven by the big lie. But behind the big lie was an even bigger lie. It is the lie that this increasingly diverse American electorate does not get to determine the future of the country. The lie and the logic of January 6th is a sickness. It is a kind of cancer that then metastasized into dozens of voter suppression laws all across our country. And we must be vigilant tonight because these anti-democratic forces are at work right now in Georgia and all across our country. And the question is, who will heal the land? And so here we are, America. Are you ready? Are you ready to stand up in this moral moment? Stand up for the best in the American covenant? Elections are about the character of a country. And we must decide, again, we are the latest generation of Americans who get to decide what kind of country we want to be. And we must choose between the promise of January 5th and the peril of January 6th. A nation that embraces 
a nation that embraces all of us or just some of us. Donald Trump's America is the America of January 6th. People who have no vision traffic in division. He does not know how to lead us, and so he wants to divide us. America, make no mistake, Donald Trump is a plague on the American conscience. He is, a press, he is a clear and present threat to the precious covenant we share with one another. And yes, I, I saw him. I saw him holding the Bible and endorsing a Bible as if it needed his endorsement. He should try reading it. It says, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. He should try reading it. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. It says, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, you have done it also unto me. I choose the American Covenant, e pluribus unum, out of many one. I choose January 5th. I choose a nation that provides a path for ordinary people and gives every child a chance. And that's Joe Biden's America. And he's been fighting for it for more than a half century. President Biden, America is so much better because of you, a true patriot who has always put the people first. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. I'll tell you something else. Not only is that Joe Biden's America, that's Kamala Harris's America. She was leading with Joe Biden when we expanded the child tax credit, cutting child poverty in America nearly in half. We ought to renew it. She cast a tie-breaking vote for my bill, capping the cost of insulin to no more than $35 per month for seniors. We ought to extend it to everybody. Together, we passed an infrastructure bill, boasted American manufacturing and clean energy, energy and investment in the house that we all share together. And I've got news for you, we are just getting started. Are you ready to win this election? Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz represent the new way forward. We're not going back. We're not going back because we are the United States of America. We always dream about the future. And so forward on women's reproductive rights because we believe that a patient's room is too small and cramped a space for a woman, her doctor, and the United States government. That's too many people in the room. Forward, forward on worker rights, because most people do not mind working. They just want to share in the prosperity that they are creating for others. Forward 
on voting rights, forward on affordable housing and access to health care. We are moving forward. And so I'm inspired tonight. I'm inspired by all of you. I'm inspired by the resilience of an American spirit that has rebounded from the pandemic and is holding at bay the forces that are trying to divide us. And I'm inspired tonight by the memory of my late father, a preacher and a junk man. Monday through Friday, he lifted old broken cars and put them on the back of an old rig. But on Sunday morning, the man who lifted broken cars lifted broken people whom other people had discarded and told them that they were God somebody. My dad discovered strength in the broken places, a power made perfect in weakness. And so I'm convinced tonight that we can lift the broken even as we climb. I'm convinced tonight that we can heal sick bodies. We can heal the wounds that divide us. We can heal a planet in peril. We can heal the land. And in a strange way, in a strange way, the pandemic taught us how. A contagious airborne disease means that I have a personal stake in the health of my neighbor. If she's sick, I may get sick also. Her health care is good for my health. I'm just trying to tell you that we are as close in our humanity as a cough. I need my neighbor's children to be okay so that my children will be okay. I need all of my neighbor's children to be okay. Poor inner city children in Atlanta and poor children of Appalachia. I need the poor children of Israel and the poor children of Gaza. I need Israelis and Palestinians. I need those in the Congo, those in Haiti, those in Ukraine. I need American children on both sides of the track to be okay. Because we are all God's children. And so let's stand together. Let's work together. Let's organize together. Let's pray together. Let's stand together. Let's heal the land. God bless you. Keep the faith. And keep looking up. Thank you so much. Love you, too. <laughs> Joe and I have been together for almost 50 years. And still, there are moments when I fall in love with him all over again. Like when I handed him our baby Ashley for the first time and saw the smile that lit up his face. Or on nights after an exhausting day in the, working in the Senate, when he would read one more bedtime story just because the kids asked. 
When he stops on a rope line because he sees someone grieving who needs to know that everything is going to be all right one day, or to encourage that child with a stutter to find the confidence she needs. Those moments when I'm reminded of all he's accomplished in the name of something bigger than himself, receiving the Medal of Freedom with humility. Placing his hand on our family Bible to take his oath of office. And weeks ago, when I saw him dig deep into his soul and decide to no longer seek re-election and endorse Kamala Harris. With faith and conviction, Joe knows that our nation's strength doesn't come from intimidation or cruelty. It comes from the small acts of kindness that heal deep wounds from service to the communities that make us who we are, from love of a country that shines with promise and renewal. Kamala Harris knows that too. Our son, Bo, first worked with Kamala when he was Attorney General of Delaware. He told me at the dinner table one night, Mom, she's special, someone to keep your eye on. And he was right. Joe and I know Kamala. We have seen her courage, her determination, and her leadership up close. Kamala and Tim, you will win. And, and you are inspiring a new generation. We are all a part of something bigger than ourselves and we are stronger than we know. The future of our country is in the hands of those in this room and all of you watching at home. It's going to take all of us, and we can't afford to lose. With faith in each other, hope for a brighter future, and love for our country, we will fight and we will win together. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome first daughter, Ashley Biden. Good evening. I have this memory. It's the eve of my eighth birthday. Dad is still in D.C., tending to urgent matters in the Senate. That night, as a surprise, Mom to told me, Bo, and Hunter to get in the car. I remember pulling up to the Wilmington Amtrak station, riding up the escalator to the platform. The train stops, doors open, and Dad steps out. As soon as I saw him, I run down that platform and jump into his arms. Like magic, Mom brought out a cake, they sang happy birthday, and I blew out the candles. Dad hugged me, and he said that he had to get back to work. He crossed to the southbound train, and off he went to D.C. That was a snapshot of one moment, of one day, on this extraordinary journey 
of being Joe Biden's daughter. Joe Biden is the OG girl dad. He told me I could be anything and I could do anything. As a child, I would sit on the leather chair in his office doing my homework, and he would sit next to me doing his work, drafting the Violence Against Women Act. And he wasn't just a girl dad. I could see, and he wasn't just a girl dad, I could see that he valued and trusted women. How he listened to his mother, how he believed in his sister, and most of all, how he respected my mother's career. Dad was always there doing everything he could to be a true partner to her. Dad, you always tell us, but we don't tell you enough, that you are the love of our lives and the life of our love. I had my wedding reception in my parents' backyard. At the time, my dad was vice president. But he was also that dad who literally set up the entire reception. He was riding around in his John Deere four-wheeler, fixing the place settings, arranging the plants. And by the way, he was very emotional. I thought that I would be a mess, but he was the one crying. And I was the one who had to comfort him. Before he walked me down the aisle, he turned to me and said that he would always be my best friend. All these years later, Dad, you are still my best friend. His example in service inspired my career. I'm a social worker in Philadelphia. I support formerly incarcerated women as they heal from past trauma and they reclaim their lives. Dad always told me that I was no better than anybody else and nobody was better than me. He taught me that everyone deserves a fair shot and that we shouldn't leave anyone behind. That's what you learn from a fighter who has been underestimated his entire life. When I look at dad, I see grace, strength, and humility. I see one of the most consequential leaders ever in history. And I also know that he never stops thinking about you, about your dreams, about your dignity, about your opportunities, about your family. Dad knows that family is everything. When Hunter and I lost our brother Bo to cancer in 2015, the grief and the pain felt like it might never end. Dad had the capacity to step out of his own pain and absorb ours. And I know that Bo is here with us tonight as he is always with us. After Bo passed, I got this tattoo on my wrist. It says, courage, dear heart. A reminder to myself to keep going, to get back up, like my dad has always done. He has taught me that a courageous heart is a miraculous thing. A courageous heart can heal a family. A courageous heart can heal a nation, and maybe even the world. And now, this election requires the courageous hearts of all of us 
In 2020, my dad selected Kamala Harris to beat Donald Trump. And he knows in 2024, she will beat Donald Trump again. So tonight, I am asking you, if you stood with us in 2020, call upon your courageous heart. Stand with us today. Work harder than you have ever worked before in your life. This is the fight of our lifetime. Our freedom, our democracy, our reproductive rights. All of this, all of it is on the ballot. And I know together we can do this because my dad helped show us the way. And now, I would like to introduce my father, your 46th President of the United States, Joe Biden. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was my daughter. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Virtual. Your... I tell you what. To my dearest daughter, Ashley. God love you, you're incredible. Thank you for the introduction and for being my courageous heart, along with Hunter and our entire family, and especially our rock, Jill. Who, as those of you who know us, she still leaves me both breathless and speechless. Everybody knows her. I love her more than she loves me. <laughs> she walks down the stairs, and I still get that going boom, boom, boom. <laughs> you all will know me. No, no, I'm kidding. Let's give a special round of applause to our First Lady, Jill Biden. <laughs> My dad. My dad used to have an expression, for real. He'd say, Joey, family is the beginning, 
the middle, and the end. And I love you all. Folks. And America, I love you. Folks, let me ask you. Let me ask you. Are you ready to vote for freedom? Are you ready to vote for democracy and for America? Yeah. Let me ask you, are you ready to elect Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz, yeah. President and Vice President of the United States? My fellow Democrats, my fellow Americans, nearly four years ago, in winter, on the steps of the Capitol, on a cold January day, I raised my right hand and I swore an oath to you and to God to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and to faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States. In front of me, in front of me was the city surrounded by the National Guard. Behind me, a capital that's two weeks before had been overrun by a violent mob. But I knew then, from the bottom of my heart, that I knew now there is no place in America for political violence. None. You cannot say you love your country only when you win. In that moment, I wasn't looking to the past. I was looking to the future. I spoke of the work at hand, the moment we had to meet. It was, as I told you then, a winter of peril and possibility, of peril and possibility. We're in the grip of a once-in-a-century pandemic, historic joblessness, a call for racial justice long overdue, clear and present threats to our very democracy. Thank you. And yet, and yet I believe then and I believe now that progress was and is possible. Justice is achievable. And our best days are not behind us, they're before us. Now it's summer. The winter has passed. And with a grateful heart, I stand before you now on this August night to report that democracy has prevailed. <laughs> democracy, democracy has delivered. And now democracy must be preserved. <laughs> You've heard me say it before. We're facing an inflection point, one of those rare moments in history when the decisions we make now will determine the fate of our nation and the world for decades to come. That's not hyperbole. I mean it literally. We're in a battle for the very soul of America. I ran for president in 2020 because of what I saw in Charlottesville in August of 2017. Extremists coming out of the woods, carrying torches, their veins bulging, 
from their necks, carrying Nazi swastikas and chanting the same exact anti-Semitic bile that was heard in Germany in the early 30s. Neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and the Ku Klux Klan, so emboldened by a president then in the White House that they saw as an ally. They didn't even bother to wear their hoods. Hate was on the march in America. Old ghosts and new garments, stirring up the oldest divisions, stoking the oldest fears, giving oxygen to the oldest forces that they long sought to tear apart America. In the process, a young woman was killed. When I contacted her mother, I asked about what happened. She told me. When the President was asked what he thought had happened, Donald Trump said, and I quote, there are very fine people on both sides. My God. That's what he said. That is what he said and what he meant. That's what I realized. Had to listen to the admonition of my dead son. I could not stay in the sidelines. So I ran. Because I had no intention of running again. I just lost part of my soul. But I ran with a deep conviction. In America, I know and believe in an America where honesty, dignity, decency still matter. An America where everyone has a fair shot and hate has no safe harbor. An America where the fundamental creed of this nation, that all of us are created equal, is still very much alive and a broad coalition of Americans joined with me. 81 million voters voted for us. More than any time in all of history. Because of all of you in this room and others, we came together in 2020 to save democracy. As your president, I've been determined keep America moving forward, not going back, to stand against hate and violence in all its forms, to be a nation where we not only live with the, and but thrive on diversity, demonizing no one, leaving no one behind, and becoming the nation that we profess to be. I also ran to rebuild the backbone of America, the middle class. I made a commitment to you that I be a president for all Americans, whether you voted for me or not. We have done that. Studies show the major bills we have passed actually delivered more to red states than blue. Because the job of the president is delivered to all of America. <laughs> and because of you, and I'm not exaggerating, because of you, we've had one of the most extraordinary four years of progress ever, period. When I say we, I mean Kamala and me. Just think about it. COVID no longer controls our lives. We've gone from economic crisis to the strongest economy in the entire world. Record 16 million new jobs. Record small business growth. Record high stock market. Record high 401ks. Wages up, and inflation down, way down, and continuing to go down. The smallest racial wealth gap in 20 years. And yes, 
We both know we have more to do, but we're moving in the right direction. More Americans have peace of mind that comes from having health insurance. More Americans have health insurance today than ever before in American history. And after, as a young senator beginning to fight, beginning to fight for 50 years to give Medicare the power to negotiate lower prescription drug prices, we finally beat Big Pharma. And guess who cast the tie-breaking vote? Vice President, soon to be President Kamala Harris. And now it's the law of the land. Instead of paying $400 a month for insulin, and seniors with diabetes will pay $35 a month. The law we passed already includes, starting in January, every senior's total prescription cost can be capped at $2,000, no matter how expensive the drugs they have. And what we don't focus on, and our Republican friends don't seem to understand, our reforms don't just save seniors' money, they save the American taxpayers' money. You know what we just passed saves? It saved $160 billion over the next decade. That's not hyperbole. It's because Medicare no longer has to pay those exorbitant prices to the big pharma. But look, well, thank you, Kamala, too. Look, folks, how can we have the strongest economy in the world without the best infrastructure in the world? Donald Trump promised Infrastructure Week every week for four years, and he never built a damn thing. But now, because of what Kamala and I have done, remember, we were told we couldn't get it done. Remember when we came into office, we couldn't get anything passed? But right now, we're giving America an infrastructure decade, not week. We're modernizing our roads, our bridges, our ports, our airports, our trains, our buses, removing every lead pipe from schools and homes so every child can drink clean water. We're providing affordable high-speed internet for every American, no matter where they live, unlike, not unlike what Roosevelt did with electricity. And so much more. We are uniting the country. We're growing our economy. We're improving our quality of life. And we're building a better America. Because that's who we are. How can we be the strongest nation in the world without leading the world in science and technology? After years of importing 90 percent of our semiconductor chips from abroad, which America invented that, those chips, our Chips and Science Act meant the private companies from around the world are now investing literally tens of billions of dollars to build new chip factories right here in America. And over that period, they'll create tens of thousands of jobs. And many of those jobs in the so-called fabs, the buildings that make the chips, that are being constructed now. And guess what? The average salary in those fabs, size of a football field, will be over $100,000 a year, and you don't need a college degree. Because of you and so many electeds out there, American manufacturing is back. Where the hell to say we wouldn't lead the world in manufacturing? 800,000 new manufacturing jobs.
Our Republican friends and others made sure they'd go abroad to get the cheapest labor. We used to import products and export jobs. Now we export American products and create American jobs right here in America, where jobs belong. With every new job, with every new factory, pride and hope is being brought back to communities throughout the country that were left behind. You know you're from them, many of you. You know what it's like when that factory closed, where your mother, your father, your grandmother, your grandfather worked. And now you're back, providing once again, proving the Wall Street didn't build America, the middle class built America, and unions, unions built the middle class. It's been my view since I came to the Senate. And that's why I'm proud to have been the first president to walk a picket line. and be labeled the most pro-union president in history, and I accept it. It's a fact. Because when unions do well, we all do well. You got it, man. You got it. I agree. I'm proud. Look, remember we told we couldn't get anything done because of the, we couldn't get anything done in the Congress? Well, with your support, we passed the most significant climate law in the history of mankind. Over $370 billion. Cutting carbon emissions in half by 2030 launching a climate core, similar to AmeriCorps and Peace Corps, creating tens of thousands of jobs for young people of the future who are going to make sure this continues. <laughs> creating hundreds of thousands of jobs in clean energy for American workers, including the IBW installing 500,000, 500,000 charging stations all across America. And in the process, reducing carbon emissions. And we're seeing it. We're seeing to it that the first beneficiaries of environmental initiatives are those fence line communities that have been smothered by the legacy of pollution. Louisiana and Delaware, Route 9. All the factors, all those chemical factors are right next to the poorest neighborhoods. They're the ones we're going to bring back. And how? How can we be the greatest nation in the world without the best education system in the world? Donald Trump and the Republican friends, they not only can't think, they can't read very well. Seriously, think about it. Look at their project. 2025, we want to do away with the Department of Education. Well, during the pandemic, Common Law helped states and cities get back their schools back open. And we gave public school teachers a raise. We created apprenticeships with businesses and communities, putting students on a path to a good paying job, whether or not they go to college. And by the way, we're making college a hell of a lot more affordable. <laughs> Increasing Pell Grants by $900. Over $15 billion for HBCUs. <laughs> Minority service engines, including Hispanic institutions and tribal colleges. We kept our commitment to provide more student relief than ever by lifting the burden of helping millions of families so they can get married, start a family, buy a home, and begin to build family wealth and contribute to the community and grow our economy. 
It's not costing us, it's creating more wealth. We fundamentally transformed how our, transformed how our economy grows, from the middle out and the bottom up, instead of the top down. You know, my dad used to say there wasn't a whole hell of a lot to drop down on my kitchen table at the end of the month. I come from a basic middle-class family. Three-bedroom house, four kids, a grandpa living with us. Decent neighborhood, but never a penny to spare. And look, that top-down notion never worked. A lot of Democrats didn't think it worked, but both thought it worked, but it doesn't. And when we did all that, what we've done, everybody can do well. Everybody. Donald Trump calls America a failing nation. No, I'm serious. Th but think about this. Think about this. He publicly says to the whole world, I'm going to say something outrageous. I know more foreign leaders by their first names and know them well than anybody alive, just because I'm so damn old. <laughs> but I'm not joking. Think of the message he sends around the world when he talks about America being a failing nation. He says we're losing. He's the loser. He's dead wrong. Many of you are very successful people who travel the world. Name me a country in the world that doesn't think we're the leading nation in the world. Without America, not a joke, think about it. I'm being literal. Who could lead the world other than the United States of America? Well, guess what? America's winning, and the world's better off for it. America's more prosperous, and America is safer today than under Donald Trump. Trump continues to lie about crime in America, like everything else. Guess what? On his watch, the murder rate went up 30 percent, the biggest increase in history. Meanwhile, we made the largest investment, Kamala and I, in public safety ever. Now, the murder rate is falling faster than any time in history. Violent crime has dropped to the lowest level of more than 50 years. And crime will keep coming down when we put a prosecutor in the Oval Office instead of a convicted felon. And folks, the distinguished senator from the sea senator from California and I passed the first ban on assault weapons. And guess what? It worked. If we care about public safety, we need to prevent gun violence. And what makes me ashamed when I travel the world, which I do, more children in America are killed by a gunshot than any other cause in the United States. More die from a bullet than cancer, accidents, or anything else in the United States of America. My God. That's why Kamala and I are proud. We beat the NRA when we passed the first major bipartisan gun safety law in 30 years. I'm serious. That comes from here. And now it's time to ban assault weapons again. And demand universal background checks. It's hard. I never thought I'd stand before a crowd of Democrats and refer to a president as a liar so many times. No, I'm not trying to be funny. It's sad. Trump continues to lie about the border. Here's what he won't tell you. Trump killed the strongest bipartisan border deal in the history of the United States that we negotiated with the Senate Republican. It took four, months, four weeks. Once it passed, and they acknowledge the most expansive border change in American history. 
He called senators to say, don't support the bipartisan bill, because he said it would help me politically and hurt him politically. My God. No, I'm serious. Think about it. Not a joke. Ask even the press who doesn't like me. They'll tell you that's true. <laughs> Typically, Trump, once again, putting himself first and America last. Then I had to take executive action. The result of the executive action I took, border encounters have dropped over 50 percent. In fact, there are fewer border crossings today than when Donald Trump left office. And unlike Trump, we will not demonize immigrants, saying they're the poison of blood of America, poison the blood of our country. Kamala and I are committed to strengthening legal immigration, including protecting dreamers and more. And here's what else I believe in. Protecting your freedom, your freedom to vote, your freedom to love who you love. And your freedom to choose. And it's, the, and it's decision over turning Roe v. Wade, as you heard earlier tonight. The United States Supreme Court majority wrote the following, quote, Women are not without electrical, without, not allowed, not without electoral, electoral or political power. No kidding. MAGA Republicans found out the power of women in 2022. And Donald Trump is going to find out the power of women in 2024. Watch. And where Trump and his mega Republican right wingers seek to erase history, we Democrats continue to write history and make more history. I'm proud. I'm proud to have kept my commitment to appoint the first black woman in the United States Supreme Court. Katanji Brown Jackson, a symbol for every young woman in America that you can do anything. I'm proud that I've kept my commitment to have an administration that looks like America and that taps in to the full talent of our nation most diverse cabinet in history, including the first black woman in South Asian descent to serve as vice president. And will soon serve as the 47th president of the United States. She is good. Look. Thank you, Kamala. Folks, I've long said we have many obligations as a nation. But I got in trouble years ago for saying I'd make no apologies. We have only one truly sacred obligation, to prepare and equip those we send to war and care for them and their families when they come home and when they don't. That's why I'm so proud they've written and signed the PACT Act, one of the most significant laws ever, helping veterans and their families exposed to toxic materials like burn pits and Asian orange. I was around during the Vietnam War. It's hard. Nobody was able to prove that their illness was a consequence of Agent Orange. And no one was able to prove initially that because they lived in burn pits, like my son lived next to in Iraq for a year, that it was the cause of their illness. But because of the PACT Act, a surviving spouse with two children 
is now eligible for a stipend of about $3,000 a month. And those children who lost a, a, a parent are eligible for tuition benefits to go to college and to get job training. It's already helping over one million veterans and their families just so far. Well, I love them, and I'm, I'm so proud of my son's service. We get it. But guess who doesn't get it and doesn't respect our veterans? We know from his own chief of staff, the four-star General John Kelly, that Trump, when in Europe, would not go to the grave sites in one of the in France, the brave service members who gave their lives to this country. He called them suckers and losers. Who in the hell does he think he is? Who does he think he is? There's no words for a person. They're not the words of a person not worthy of being commander-in-chief, period. Not then, not now, and not ever. I mean that. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Just as no commander in chief should ever bow down to a dictator the way Trump bows down to Putin. I never have, and I promise you, Kamala Harris will never do it. We'll never bow down. When Trump left office, Europe and NATO was in tatters. Not a joke. America First doctrine changed our whole image in the world. Well, I spent, they gave the hours, about 190 hours, some total, being with my counterparts or heads of state in Europe to strengthen NATO. We did. We united Europe like it hadn't been united for years adding Finland and Sweden to NATO. <laughs> Ten days before he died, Henry Kissinger called and said, not since, not since Napoleon has Europe not looked over their shoulder at Russia with dread until now, until now. Well, guess what? Putin thought he'd take Kyiv in three days. Three years later, Ukraine is still free. When I came to office, the conventional wisdom was that China would inevitably surpass the United States. They haven't noticed. No one's saying that now. And we'll keep working to bring hostages home and end the war in Gaza and bring peace and security to the Middle East. As you know, I wrote a peace treaty for Gaza. A few days ago, I put forward a proposal that brought us closer to doing that than we've done since October 7th. We're working around the clock, my Secretary of State, to prevent a wider war and reunite hostages with their families and surge humanitarian health and food assistance into Gaza now. <laughs> to end the civilian suffering of the Palestinian people. And finally, finally, finally deliver a ceasefire and end this war. Those, those protesters out in the street, they have a point. A lot of innocent people are being killed on both sides. Just as we worked around the clock to bring home wrongfully detained Americans and others from Russia in one of the most complicated swaps in history, but they're home. Kamala and I are going to keep working to bring all Americans wrongfully defamed around the world home. 
I mean it. Folks, I've got five months left in my presidency. I've got a lot to do. I intend to get it done. It's, the, it's been the honor of my lifetime to serve as your president. I love the job, but I love my country more. I love my country more. And all this talk about how I'm angry at all those people who said I should step down, that's not true. I love my country more, and we need to preserve our democracy. In 2024, we need you to vote. We need you to keep the Senate. We need you to win back the House of Representatives. And above all, we need you to beat Donald Trump. And elect Kamala and Tim, President and Vice President of the United States of America. Look, they'll continue to lead America forward, creating more jobs, standing up for workers, growing the economy, lower the cost to American families so they just have a little more breathing room. We've made incredible process, progress. We have more work to do. And Kamala and Tim, will continue to take on corporate greed and bring down cost of food. They'll keep taking on big farm and making insulin $35 a month, not just for seniors, but for everyone in America. And capping prescription drug costs, a total of $2,000, not just for seniors, but for everyone. And folks, that's going to save America again tens of billions of dollars. Folks, they'll make housing more affordable, building 3 million new homes, providing $25,000 down payment assistance for the first-time home buyer. More than the 10 we approved. Donald Trump wants a new tax on imported goods, food, gas, clothing, and more. You know what that would cost the average family, according to the experts? $3,900 a year in a tax. No, that's, that's a fact. Kamala and Tim will make the child care tax rate a permanent. <laughs> Lifting millions of children out of poverty and helping millions of families get ahead. But you know what Trump has? He put the he created the largest debt any president had in four years with his $2 trillion tax cut for the wealthy. Well, Trump has a new plan. He wants to provide a $5 billion tax cut for corporations of the very wealthy. Put a, read it. Put us further in debt. And folks, you know we have a thousand trillion we have a thousand billionaires in America. You know what their average tax rate they pay? 8.2 percent. If we just increase their taxes, we proposed the 25 percent, which isn't the highest tax rate even, it would raise 500 billion new dollars over 10 years. And they'd still be very wealthy. Look. Kamala and Tim are going to make them pay their fair share. They'll protect Social Security and Medicare. Trump wants to cut Social Security and Medicare. Kamala and Tim will protect your freedom. They'll protect your vote to right, your right to vote. They'll protect your civil rights. And you know Trump will do everything to ban abortion nationwide.
Oh, he will. You know, Kamala and Tim will do everything they possibly can. That's why you have to elect a Senate and a House to restore Roe v. Wade. The ancient Greeks taught us that character is destiny. Character is destiny. For me and Jill, we know Kamala and Doug are people of character. It's been our honor to serve alongside them. And we know that Tim and Gwen Waltz are also people of great character. Selecting Kamala was the very first decision I made before I became — when I became our nominee. And it was the best decision I made my whole career. We've not only gotten to know each other, we've become close friends. She's tough, she's experienced, and she has enormous integrity — enormous integrity. Her story represents the best American story. And like many of our best presidents, she was also vice president. That's a joke. But she'll be a president our children can look up to. She'll be a president respected by world leaders because she already is. She'll be a president we can all be proud of. And she will be an historic president who puts her stamp on America's future. This will be the first presidential election since January 6th. On that day, we almost lost everything about who we are as a country. And that threat — this is not hyperbole — that threat is still very much alive. Donald Trump says he will refuse to accept the election result if he loses again. Think about that. He means it. Think about that. He's promising a bloodbath if he loses, in his words, and that he'll be a dictator on day one, in his own words. By the way, this sucker means it. No, I'm not joking. Think about it. Anybody else said that in the past, you'd think he was crazy. He is crazy, but you'd think it was an exaggeration. But he means it. We can't let that happen. Folks, all of us carry a special obligation. Independents, Republicans, Democrats, we saved democracy in 2020, and now we must save it again in 2024. The vote of each of us cast this year will determine whether democracy and freedom will prevail. It's that simple. It's that serious. And the power is literally in your hands. History is in your hands, not hyperbole. It's in your hands. America's future is in your hands. Let me close with this. Nowhere else in the world could a kid with a stutter and modest beginnings in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and Claymont, Delaware, grow up to sit behind the Resolute desk in the Oval Office. That, that's because America is and always has been a nation of possibilities. Possibilities. We must never lose that. Never. Kamala and Tim understand that this nation must continue to be a place of possibilities, not just for the few of us, but for all of us. But join me and promising your whole heart to this effort, and where my heart will be. I promise I'll be the best volunteer Harrison Waltz has Cam have ever seen. Each of us has a part in the American story. For me and my family, 
There's a song that means a lot to us, that captures the best of who we are as a nation. The song is called American Anthem. There's one verse that stands out, and I can't sing with the dance, so I'm not going to try. <laughs> I'll just quote it. The work and prayers of centuries have brought us to this day. What shall our legacy, our legacy be? What will our children say? Let me know in my heart when my days are through. America, America, I gave my best to you. mistakes in my career, but I gave my best to you. For 50 years, like many of you, I've given my heart and soul to our nation. And I've been blessed a million times in return for the support of the American people. I've either been the, too young to be in the Senate because I wasn't 30 yet, and too old to stay as president. But I hope you know how grateful I am to all of you. I can honestly say, and I mean this in the bottom, give me my word as a Biden, I can honestly say I'm more optimistic about the future than I was when I was elected as a 29-year-old United States Senator. I mean it. <laughs> Folks, we just have to remember who we are. We're the United States of America. And there's nothing we cannot do when we do it together. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops.